during the latter 1940s and the early 1950s, as a part of my law practice in Washington, one of the clients was the French Embassy and some of the agencies of the French government. During this period, I worked with Jean Monnet on the beginnings of an effort to put Europe together. I worked very closely with a number of the other people in the French government. And as a consequence, I lived with them, in a sense, through the agonies of Dien Bien Phu and the tragic feelings that were developing on, among Frenchmen about the dirty war that they were fighting in Indochina. And I got some sense, just from the conversations that I had then, of the difficulties of the terrain, of the complexity of the political problems that they faced, of the difficulties that any white man would have fighting in what was of necessity a revolutionary anti-colonial situation in, in Indochina. And I'm sure this had a good deal to do with uh, shaping the attitude that I took when the problem first arose of uh, the United States uh, playing a role in uh, trying to assist the South Vietnamese. It seemed to me that we were walking into a, a situation which the French had found untenable. And while it was certain that we would have a great deal more firepower and we had more manpower if we cared to commit it, that nevertheless, this was not a situation in which we should involve ourselves. Was there ever a time when you didn't oppose our involvement in Vietnam? Was there ever a time when you thought it was a good idea? No, I never thought it was a good idea. It seemed to me that uh, this was not an area of the world that was strategically important so far as we were concerned. And I, I felt from the very beginning that we were starting down a path which could very well involve us in a land war on the mainland of Asia. I told President Kennedy when we were talking one afternoon, uh, soon after the Taylor Rostow report was made, that I thought it would be a, a very grave mistake to accept the recommendations of the report and to go down that road. But if we did, I. I felt it very likely that we would have as many as 300,000 men on the mainland of Asia in the paddies and jungles of Vietnam, that this was terrible country, and that uh, it was an impossible situation for the United States to get itself into. And uh, President Kennedy uh, said to me, well, uh, I think you're just crazier than hell. Uh, this isn't going to happen. Well, of course, I grossly understated the reality as it developed. Um, was there ever a time when you were ashamed of what was finally done? Well, I was, uh, I was in disagreement with the decision, and I thought the decision was unfortunate. Uh, to say that I was ashamed, I don't think that's quite the right word. I felt that uh, my government was, was making a mistake, but no government is, is infallible. I, I suppose one starts with the premise that all war is morally bad. Whether some wars are morally worse than others is, is very difficult to judge. Whether some types of weapons are worse than others, whether napalm is worse than, than fragment, uh, fragmentation bombs, for example. I don't know. The, the victim is killed in any event. One seems more unattractive than the other. I don't, uh, I find it difficult to pass moral judgments of this sort. I, I think that uh, Abstractly, uh, one could say that this was uh, the United States got itself in a position where it was doing things that were, were unworthy of a, of a great country. When the bombing uh, campaign started in the early part of 1965, the greatest sense of urgency about beginning a bombing was the sense that the political situation in Saigon was falling apart. After the death of, of Jem, there had been a succession of military hunters in control of the situation. And morale in Saigon and in South Vietnam was felt to be at a very low point. The hope was uh, expressed then by General Taylor and by some of the others that if we could immediately start bombing, that this would speed uh, the improve the morale and that uh, therefore the chances of survival of the South Viet government uh, of, of the day was very much better than it, it would have been otherwise. 
So we started. We started on a basis which was to be tit for tat, that we were merely to respond to incidents. But as uh, uh, time went on, this became a, a uh, rather systematic bombing campaign. And the philosophy of bombing, which General Taylor set forth, was, I suppose, the, the principal uh, uh, basis for the kind of campaign that we conducted. That is, he had a feeling that if we could gradually raise the bombing line from initial bombing on the southern part of, of, south, of North Vietnam uh, toward Hanoi and the industrialized uh, centers in the north, that at some point, this would create such pressure on the government in Hanoi that uh, uh, the government would feel compelled to begin negotiations. Uh, I personally uh, was not inclined to agree with this because I had a, quite a different ses assessment of the determination of the uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. I felt that having carried on this fight for a quarter of a century, they were not about to quit under some bombing which could uh, not have as great an effect as bombing of a, a really heavily industrialized country could have. The problem of civilian casualties uh, that might result from the air offensive were a very great preoccupation, particularly with President Johnson, because uh, he agonized over the, the uh, danger that, uh, in fact, the, the inevitable result that uh, a bombing might kill a, a certain number of civilians. He was so concerned with this that uh, every day he himself personally reviewed the, the bombing targets and the military estimates as to what civilian casualties might be. After we in the State Department had already been over the targets and made our rec uh, prepared our recommendations. And he eliminated a great part of the targets which the military wanted to bomb because he thought that the, the uh, areas involved were too heavily populated uh, or that the target, the military target, was too near civilian housing or something of the sort and that too many civilians would uh, be hurt or, or killed. So that it, uh, this was not a, a situation in which the human factor was neglected or in which uh, the element of compassion didn't exist. I think the, the president uh, uh, felt very deeply the the fact that uh, this was destructive of civilian lives as well as of military lives. But he nonetheless went ahead. He nonetheless went ahead because he felt that, that all of the other reasons were, were compelling and that he had uh, no real option, which doesn't mean at all that he didn't personally agonize over, over every decision or that he didn't examine uh, with very great attention uh, what the costs of extrication might be at any point. Uh, again, I, I was, it was my personal uh, uh, business because I felt deeply about the matter to urge on the President the desirability of extrication and to try to point out that the costs were not as high as, as some of the others uh, who were advising him felt they were. It was a difficult time because as time went on I found myself more and more isolated, so to speak, because I was the only one that was urging this kind of a policy. And I suppose I got a little monotonous because people knew what I was going to say. I was predictable so that from time to time the president would turn to me and say, well, now, George, let's hear the other side, uh, knowing that I, that represented my view. But he didn't decide your way. He didn't decide my way, although there were occasions when he rejected proposals for uh, escalation at the end of a very long argument in which he said uh, that he agreed with me and he was not going to go forward. Now, the fact, uh, facts were that uh, as the pressures build up and the situation uh, would perhaps deteriorate, two or three later, or month, weeks later, we would probably do the thing he had decided not to do at that time. But I think that at least uh, the, the efforts that I made of, of advocacy uh, did gain some time, for better or worse. I don't know what the judgment should be. You've also said that at the State Department, uh, part of your job was to go over bombing targets and then pass them along to the White House. Well, if you had already sort of gone on record as opposing the bombing and the involvement overall, uh, if you'd already gone on record as being in opposition, how were you able to go over bombing targets with a pencil and decide, you know, which Well, once the, once the president had made the decision uh, to go forward with bombing, uh, 
then the bombing was going to go forward. And uh, I was, after all, a member of the administration. What I tried to do in going over the targets was to minimize the civilian casualties and uh, to discourage uh, uh, the bombing of a substantial number of targets, which the military wanted to bomb, because I thought too many civilian lives would be lost and the escalation would go too fast. Uh, we weren't uh, trying to acquire territory. We were trying to, to help stop uh, a, what we felt was an aggression or what uh, the president felt was an aggression. And we were trying to do it with the, the least destruction of human life. But as the situation got on, and the, there was a compulsion to use more and more barbarous weapons, simply because the, the weapons we were using weren't succeeding. And there was a feeling that we had to win this once we were involved uh, or undercut our commitments around the world. After Tet, there was a meeting of the senior advisors these so-called wise men, once again, to review the situation. I rather think Clark Clifford had suggested to the president that he, he have this review because uh, Clark Clifford at that time was very concerned about the, the new demands for troops and the way the matter, the situation was escalating. We met in the evening. We had dinner with uh, at the State Department with Secretary Rusk and I believe with Secretary McNamara. Uh, we had a briefing afterwards in the, in the uh, State Department and the, uh, the briefers were, gave us a very discouraging view of the situation following Tet. The next morning we met again, and I was surprised to find the amount of pessimism amongst the, the group of senior advisors, and indeed to find so many of them uh, talking about the need for, for cutting our losses and extrication. Uh, I was uh, very much uh, surprised when Mac Bundy, who, George Bundy, who was been asked to speak for the group, said, well, Mr. President, to summarize, I, for the first time, find myself in agreement with George Ball. And uh, then he summarized the views of the others, and it was, uh, they were, for the most part, uh, very much in, in favor of some kind of, of extrication, that we couldn't go forward with the pressures for greater uh, deployments and uh, an increased involvement. I think the president was very shaken by this because I don't think he expected it and I, I think it came as quite a, a shock because in the past the senior advisors had always been very gung-ho and to find this shift in sentiment amongst people that he respected I think uh, did come as quite a shock to him. And I suspect that this uh, had uh, some effect in the final decision he made not to run again. Given your constant opposition from the war's outset. Why did you stay in government? Well, it's a very complicated uh, uh, answer, and uh, it's one about which I have no doubt. I mean, I, I never felt I, sh I should uh, uh, issue a mea culpa. Uh, I had many things to do in the government. I looked at my own uh, docket not very long ago. Uh, during this time, I was spending about 5% of my time on Vietnam. I wasn't actively engaged in the day-to-day -day planning of it. There were other people who were expert who were doing this. It didn't really interest me very much until it became an all-consuming matter for the United States government because I was preoccupied with a, with a dozen things during that time. Uh, I, I rather resented the fact that I had to spend any time at all on Vietnam because it wasn't an area of the world which I, I knew very much about. It wasn't an area of the world which seemed to me to be strategically very important, but we found ourselves deflecting more and more effort there. Now, I could have, uh, have resigned at any time, but given the, the nature of our government, since it's a presidential government and, and not a parliamentary government, since uh, even the heads of departments, the secretaries of the departments, are really hired hands of the president, uh, they stay at, at his will. Uh, they have no, no seat in parliament uh, as uh, do members of the British government, for example. They have no role in the party, as do, in, the, in the normal case, as do members of the British government. If I had quit, it would have been noticed in the newspaper for a day or two, and uh, I would have taken myself out of a role which I thought would have been quite interesting. I don't think it would have made much a splash, and I certainly don't think it would have had any serious effect on the war. As far as the White House was concerned, I think it would simply have dug the president and my colleagues in even more deeply, saying that uh, uh, fellow, he defected. He was... Uh, he was never any good anyway. Uh, and uh, that wouldn't have, have deterred them from going forward. So 
I saw no, no useful purpose to be served by it. On the, on the other hand, there were many things I was doing which I was vitally interested in, uh, and I, I wanted to go ahead with them. I, uh, I do think it was regrettable that uh, the public was not given a clearer and more comprehensive view of what uh, was occurring, and uh, on the whole was given a, a more optimistic picture of the war than, in fact, uh, many of us felt at least. A part of this reflected the fact that uh, there was a variety of interpretations on the news which existed within Washington itself. And there were some people who were almost pathologically optimistic. They, they always put the best uh, side on everything because they believed it. They wanted to believe it. But uh, I don't think the public did get a, a full and complete picture of things by any means. There were a number of operations that were being conducted in Laos. Uh, there were some of our relations with Cambodia, which were never reported. I think there were also times when uh, the body counts tended to be inflated, but that was just a result of the process. As these figures came up through the military, they, they were based on very inadequate evidence, and there was a tendency, I think, on the part of, of lower uh, uh, echelons uh, to make the situation look better than it was. I think that the, that the government ought to be as candid as possible with the people. I think the government got into very bad habits. Those habits came were started in the, first world, uh, in the Second World War when we were fighting a, a stealthy enemy, a corrupt, uh, vicious enemy. And to some extent, uh, the Western powers, including the United States, uh, adopted some of the met methods of the Nazis to defeat the Nazis. This started us down this course, and then the Cold War came along, and the Cold War was a very mysterious affair because the enemy we were fighting was, was an opaque, uh, a black uh, enemy that, that operated by, by subversion, that operated by corruption, that operated uh, by stealth. And uh, we got into some of those habits. I think we overdid it. I hope that, uh, that we will get out of that situation. That's one reason I, I, uh, I think we should stop trying to, uh, to justify too many things under the guise of, of national security. I think it's a good idea to take a, a careful look at the uh, way in which the war was conducted, uh, simply with the hope that we'll never find ourselves in that situation again. On the other hand, uh, even though sackcloth and ashes seem to be haute couture in some uh, quarters, I certainly don't think that that's very useful. Uh, I think that, uh, by and large, uh, breastfeeding uh, uh, improves the chest muscles more than it does the gray cells. And what I'm concerned with is that we really learn some lessons from our experience. What do you see uh, for the future? You've given a couple of past presidents some advice. Uh, how would you advise future presidents? <laughs> well, I'm not going to be asked to advise the present president, I can assure you of that. Uh, you mean about, about such matters as the as a, as a Vietnamese war? Well, as I say, I think that uh, what we should learn from this experience is primarily the, the very cautious use of American power. We should be very sure that we don't commit our power, our prestige, our, uh, the standing of the United States to a situation in which uh, the political and, and physical terrain is quite unsuited and where the, the uh, strategic significance is, is at least mar only marginal. And also, I think there is a lesson in the assessment of a local situation, because the war in Vietnam was fundamentally a, an indigenous revolt. It had an overlay of, of aggression from outside, but fundamentally, this was an argument amongst the, the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese peoples in which the issue of colonialism was, was not absent. And the fact that white uh, men appeared in a, in a situation of that kind uh, created an almost impossible uh, uh, political and moral and, uh, and philosophical terrain in which we could uh, conduct the, the, the war effectively.